Um, welcome. Uh, I think we're in for a real treat today. Um, my colleague and uh, friend Scott Beatty is going to be talking to us about community-engaged research. Scott is a faculty member in the Department of Social Work um, and a key member of uh, the CPAR, the Center for AIDS Research, um, really uh, driving a lot of the community-engaged research. I think that um, he'll talk to us about what that really means, but I think this is a key component to doing research that actually will change things. Because if the community isn't behind you, it's really hard to make any sort of difference. Thank you, Scott. Great. Thanks, Emily. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. As Emily mentioned, my name is Scott Bailey. I'm from the Department of Social Work, and I like to connect dots. So there might be many sub-themes here So uh, throughout the talk, so let me further connect dots a little bit. I do have affiliation with the Center for H Research. That's where the bulk of, that's where all of my research really is, is, uh, is housed. Um, I also have secondary faculty appointments in, in medicine and in, uh, infectious diseases, and also in public health and health behavior. Um, so um, I, I kind of live between the humanities building and Bevel. So uh, if you can't catch me in my offices, you can catch me on these sidewalks between the, these, these sides of campus. Um, so let me, before I kind of jump into my talk today, which I titled Getting to the Heart of the Matter, um, let me just poll those of you who I don't know already uh, to understand where you're coming from. So how many, uh, how many uh, doctoral students do we have in the room? I know that we've got one, a couple, three, good. Um, and four, what, uh, what departments? Medical sociology. Okay, and psychology. psychology. Psychology, behavior, neuroscience. Great. Nursing. Nursing, excellent. And do we have folks that are in training below the doctoral level in graduate graduate school or undergraduate training? Okay, fellows. A couple of fellows here. Have a postdoc that just entered. Hi. <laughs> and then I'm assuming that the that everyone else is faculty at some level. Correct? Okay, excellent. So my second question to you is, um, let's see how much you think you, you know, how you would assess yourself in terms of being, uh, community engaged research. So how many of you define yourself as a community engaged researcher? Okay, uh, how many of you feel like that you do research that is somehow placed and that's the key word, placed in the community. Okay, excellent. And then how many of you feel like that you do research or want to do research that will impact the community? Ah, okay, good. Excellent place to start. All right, so what we're going to do today, I'm, I, so first of all, for those of you who know me, if you came expecting a formal high science talk, I am not your guy, all right? I, what you see is what you get. This is incredibly informal. I appreciate interaction. Stop me in the middle, ask questions. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. This is gonna be a talk really about a framework and a philosophy that I'd like for you to consider and think about, okay? So we're gonna talk briefly about defining community to make sure that we're all on the same page from there. We'll move to then if we know what the community is, what is community engagement? Um, we'll talk about the basis and the relevance of that. Then I'm going to talk um, specifically about community engaged research and what that means. And then finally, I'll give you an example of how um, I have pulled or attempted to pull all of that together in my work. Start with this quote, uh, kind of where my title came from as I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to convey to you guys, um, this is this kind of hit home. Um, to be efficient in getting to the heart of the matter in life, or in medicine, or in research, or in whatever, uh, know what it ma know what matters to the heart. So, how do you find out? I'm going to interrupt, but can you share your screen? Can you share your screen? Oh, we can try. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if that was. Jesus, or, we do have people you know, on Zoom. So. I did expect when I heard Jesus that it would be a female's voice. I didn't take that much. Let's see. Jesus. 
chair down at the bottom there. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ah, great. No problem. Thanks Thank you. Asking. Yes, absolutely. So, um, to be efficient in getting to the heart of the matter in life, know what matters to the heart. So let me ask you, what do you think we mean by the term community? People we see every day. People that we see every day. Where? In our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Work, neighborhoods, entertainment spaces. Okay. How do you think that we, how, when you think about your community, what do you think about? What are the characteristics? People we're connected to, so we have something in common with, or we share something, okay. some experience. Some, some shared experience. Excellent. Others want to add? People that are living under the same ethical rules. Under the same, it's not like about the regional zone, but it's about the, what you feel, what you understand by the word. Yeah, yeah. So, so in some sense, maybe uh, cultural norms, uh, mores, those kinds of things, okay? So guided by, with, in addition to similar interests or goals or objectives, guided by similar parameters of, of, of value structure, okay? People yes, at, sir. People at different stages of their lives. Yeah. So diversity, mm -hmm. different stages of their lives. So in terms of age and uh, and maturation and all of those things. Great. Dr. So I, I agree with all of the definitions because some of that depends on of where you see the community that more of my tribes, who do I interact. The way is how I can see community engage research, and this may get into later, is building in each one of those communities to help a group of people excel as a source. So for example, if, if, if it's HIV, it's the HIV community and where interact and live and play and, and relate. Some of that is work, some of that may be church, some of that may be entertainment and so forth. So yeah. I think some of that is Yeah. So I think I, I, I think you're right and I think you're all right. Um, I will tell you that this uh, in the literature has not always been an easy term to define. So um, many, many, many definitions of community, but one that I particularly appreciate um, that is relevant to uh, the definition of community as it pertains to public health is from a single study that's 20 years old. So if you'll indulge me for just a minute, I'm going to take you back to 1998. Um, and talk about the study a little bit. So the study was actually published um, by McQueen and Dave Metzger and some other people in the American Journal of Public Health in 2001, but the, um, the participants were between 1995 and 1998. This was a qualitative study, uh, 118 individuals in three sites, um, and it was groups, subpopulations of people. So in, um, in Durham, North Carolina, it was African Americans, broadly speaking, all adults. In San Francisco, it was gay men, all adults. In Philadelphia, it was all infectious drug users. So there were some differences among these populations. But in addition to um, many things that were asked of them in face to face and telephone interviews during this three year period, um, the question about what does community mean to you or what is a community was asked of, of everyone. And what they through the qualitative analyses, what they ended up on was this definition of community, and this will sound familiar because you all have come up with many of these components. It's a group of people with diverse characteristics, linked by social ties, sharing common perspectives, and engaging in joint action in geographical locations or settings. And five core elements or common elements to the definitions of community included locus, which is really about the place or the setting, the sharing that you guys have talked about, the joint action, so motivated towards some goal, social ties, and then the diversity. 
I think you hit on all of that. So maybe you know more than what you alluded to when we first started. So think about that as we, as we continue on. With a shared definition of community, then the question becomes why engage the community? So I'm not going to keep asking you guys these questions because clearly I've, I've got a, an answer uh, myself. But think about that. What are the benefits to engaging the community? Um, I do not do a talk as a social work researcher that I do not share the slide. Um, and so if you are not familiar, I'll, I'll orient you very quickly. So this is just a, a illustration of the socio-ecological perspective. And basically in, in lay terms, what this tells me is that we do not exist as individuals in a silo. We have influences at many different levels at the interpersonal level, uh, made up of family, peers, social networks, um, the provider, patient um, um, uh, relationship, at the organizational level, at the community level, and then so on, and even the macro or more macro um, health policy or public policy level. And while an individual is very clearly can be influenced by these multiple levels, the individual also influences those levels. So this is a bi-directional relationship. And I, I think often about my work with my um, brilliant colleagues at the 1917 Clinic, some of which have joined us in the room, Dr. Barbara. Um, and in conversations early on, I was struck by what they know about their patients, and some of you can relate to this, or is often what the patient, often what the patient tells them or through lab tests, those kinds of things that are collected during a snapshot of that patient's life, a snapshot. So we have established a point uh, for new patients, I think maybe a, a, an appointment time for an hour and we do, we do needs assessments and biopsychosocial assessments so we get to know the patient. But after that, our providers basically follow, as long as things are going well, basically follow up generally every six months for 15 minute slots. Well, what it takes for a patient to arrive, just simply to arrive at that 15 minute spot is phenomenal. So this struck me um, at one particular case when I talked with an individual who was a um, participant in a study and uh, he kept missing his study business and naively I was like, why would this happen? And so he begins to tell me what he has to go through to get from center point to the clinic right up the road. So when I get in my car and I drive 15 minutes on a good day and traffic, I drive 25 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but I get here in a relatively short amount of time. This gentleman was having to uh, maneuver substance abuse treatment, get, get excused from substance abuse treatment, find transportation to the clinic, pay for transportation to the clinic. And then when he gets there, do the whole thing on the way back home. It took an entire day for him to come for his medical appointments. So thinking more broadly about what, what, what holistically, what impacts an individual um, is the perspective that I come from. And then I think about that and why is it important to engage the community? I can engage an individual as a patient, as a client, and that's fine. There's lots of things that you can do in, the, in, in, in that amount of time. But if I want the broader picture of an individual, I have to think of them outside of that um, experience. And our National Institutes of Health have begun to notice and, and comment on the importance of community engagement as well. This quote is from NIAID in 2009. Partnering with the community is necessary to create change and improve health. And think about it. So really, the work that we do in terms of prevention, in terms of medical interventions, or other behavioral so, uh, social interventions, where do they happen? They may happen with individuals, they may happen with the community, they may happen with organizations, but they're always placed outside of these four walls, okay? And so generally at the community level. And then when you think about health disparities, um, we know that disadvantaged groups systematically suffer from worse health outcomes, and there's a lot of evidence that supports that the more that you engage individuals in defining what the, what the problems are and how to address them will 
uh, um, mediate health disparities. There's solid evidence exists that community engagement interventions have positive impacts on a range of health outcomes across various conditions. And so this is where I get a little bit on my soapbox and, 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 and I'm just gonna apologize for that. But I think community engagement, particularly in the work that I do with disenfranchised populations, people who have for so long in their life been ostracized, been uh, isolated, um, that really community engagement is a matter of ethics. And it's a matter of ethics because community engagement can increase the likelihood of long-term benefits of the community. So my work is more likely to be sustained in the community if the community has a voice in that work. It ensures that disparities and inequalities are not inadvertently replicated or reinforced. I'll talk about an example uh, in the future that, uh, or, but at the end of this talk where um, I have a, a community advisory board that's very clear about when, when I step out of line, outside of my lane, things that I don't know. And I appreciate that. But and certainly uh, disparities and inequalities would not be replicated or reinforced on purpose by anyone in this room. But inadvertently, this can happen. And having the community help guide those discussions is important. And then it prioritizes management of stigma and involuntary isolation as well. Community engagement's really been talked about quite frequently since the earliest of times. So kind of the Bible, if you will, of community engagement or the principles of community engagement, which were um, authored uh, back uh, now uh, more than 20 years ago. And in that initial version of those principles of community engagement, the CDC had this quote about community engagement, that it's a powerful vehicle for bringing about environmental and behavioral changes that will improve the health of the community. So community engagement, um, by the way, so I, I don't consider myself a community engagement expert. I think about community engagement more like a philosophy, and I think I alluded to that sooner. So if you think about um, self-actualization, for example, none of us ever theoretically reach self-actualization. But there are things that we do to aspire to that, that we become more self-actualized. So I kind of think that, that that's how I think about community engagement. I don't consider myself to be community engaged and that I've reached the pinnacle. So I still learn every day. But some of the things that I believe about community engagement is that it is more than community participation. It's more than going to a health fair and putting a flyer for your study. I see smiles around the room of people like Dr. Crockett who have heard me say this in meetings before. So putting a flyer out about your study is not community engagement. It's necessary to recruit your, your participants. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not community engagement, okay? Um, community engagement is working collaboratively towards shared goals and interest. It's building authentic partnerships, and these words are chosen very carefully, authentic partnerships that are based on mutual respect and active, inclusive participation. It's power sharing and equity, and I'm gonna spare you a lecture on feminist theory and race theory that, that, that this work is grounded in, but it's, it, 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 this is not easy for people in academia to sit at a table and let go and say that you don't know everything about everything. <laughs> uh, but that's necessary in order to become more community engaged. And then there's mutual benefit in the collaborative initiative, both by the community and the researcher. So another thing that I don't want you to think is that at the end of this talk, is that everything that the community makes all the calls, because that's not the way it happens either in community engagement. By the way, just a reminder, stop me if you have questions or comments. Yeah. Yes. I have a tonight question in the back of my mind as you're defining this is so I keep thinking about community based participatory research. Does that kind of fall under the umbrella of community, community based and participatory research? Does that fall under the umbrella of community engaged research? It does. Or is that it does, and we're gonna talk about that too. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. Um yeah, so yes, I'll get to that. Um so talking about that continuum of community engagement. Um, this has been actually um, uh, talked about to some degree in, in the literature 
that continue, uh, community engagement lies on this continuum. And it stretches from outreach here on the left all the way to shared leadership. And you'll have access to these slides. I'm not going to go through this in, in, in particularly um, each thing. But the idea here is that anything on this continuum might be might fall within the umbrella of community engagement. But none of it singularly is community engagement. So the idea about this continuum is that even if you start being community engaged at this outreach level, which is the very fathers to the left, the goal of community engagement is that there are meaningful and purposeful advances to the right to share leadership. So even the community outreach and, and stuff that may happen on this end is done so from a community engagement perspective with long-term goals of relationship um, relationship building and shared leadership. Yes, sir. On that last slide, I see the outcomes on the bottom. I think outcomes may immediately jump to measurement. So in terms of thinking about opportunities for, for measurement of these outcomes, um, is it done? How is it done? Is it qualitative or quantitative tools? Just trying to think around, and, and again, Kaylee's point, a lot of folks say, I, I do CDPR, I do community engaged research, but I mean, where that fits and falls on this broader spectrum, there might be debate in terms of you know, how that really fits up. In terms of measuring these outcomes, that, is it done routinely and how is it done? Are, are there quantitative tools or is it really more of a qualitative assessment? So, so generally speaking, so, so let me say that community engagement is not, is not owned by qualitative methodology. All right? So there, you, you absolutely can be community engaged and, and collect quantitative measures as well. I'm not sure, are you asking like measuring the, the, the amount of community engagement or just in general, whatever you're... I, it'd be really interesting to look and say, here's a group of folks in different places that are doing community engaged science in some capacity. Could you measure effectively do you truly have this outcome of shared leadership is broad health outcome? I mean, like, you know, are there ways to assess and measure the degree to which a research group is truly working with partners in doing community, you know, where they fall on the spectrum? Yeah. So I think, so I, I don't know the, the, the exact answer to your question, but mm -hmm. I think theoretically, absolutely, there's a way to measure that. And I think this partly does that. Uh, at least well, that's the framework. Uh, influence this from my perspective considerably is before. And if anyone in the room has looked at how you applied for a grant to the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute and what the requirements are, it's not all the things you said are, are spot on. You, you can't just do focus groups or have input from people. You need to have them as part of your study team. They need to be investigators. If you're going to be successful, you need to have community members, not professional patients, not people from patient advocacy organizations, but bona fide people from whatever community you're studying as part of your research team. And you will not do well in the review process unless you can demonstrate that. And so that is, I think, all the way at the far end of yeah. shared leadership and has really, um, you know, basically forced the issue for those we want to get funding from that particular research source, which we hope will continue to yeah. exist. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. I see this also as an opportunity for either learning more or doing research in terms of linking outcomes to measure, process outcomes or process right. measures to measure this. How does it affect the definitions and the current work? And where are we with that? So, for example, if the idea is the quarry or some institutions or somebody else who has done research on how do we do the metrics for this, yeah. if that research is done, this and that, and so forth, great, someone should know that. If that information is not available, yeah. what a rich opportunity for defining the metrics to define the continuum of what you yeah, want. Yeah, that's what I, I was trying to get at. You articulated it much more succinctly and you really did. But the idea, like for the consult, like is there a way to use network? analysis tools to say if it's developed connections that there's, there's quantitative ways to, to just try to think around if that science isn't there is there a way to kind of maybe right. move that science you know and even like some of the things are a bit more challenged like collaborate you know partnership building and trust building I would have to think that with some sort of psychometric work you know um, could develop some tools that could really get at 
is this just letters of support and, and hand waving, or is there some you know substantive, meaningful partnership and trust? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think there's there's opportunity for that. So I don't think that it. I know that it doesn't exist broadly now, uh, but an opportunity absolutely, particularly as community engagement becomes. I mean, continues to be such uh, a key um, part of many of our conversations. I'm curious. Who is here from public health? Who may? Do you guys want to weigh in? I think it's fascinating. Is that? I'm curious. Well, we have another center dedicated to this very topic that does actually bring in and has community members actively engaged in its leadership. Uh, I'm not part of that center actually, but uh, it is another one of the URIX university wide resources. And as uh, Dr. Sag correctly noted, most of our grants these days have this as a sin qua non feature that you are in fact getting external input into how you structure these programs right. uh, in, in a more substantive way. But yeah. The reason I'm here is to learn how to do it better, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think that, I mean, I think you guys have really picked up on, on an opportunity here because if we're going to continue to see this even as formally as in, in, in RFAs, then we need to, people need to know, am I doing this right? Because you can't just assume. And right now, I think I, I, so much of what I know about community engagement is just doing it and, 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 and trying to get better and being open to learning and reading and that kind of thing. But um, in terms of formal, um, ways to measure just are, are not well established. There is this laser pulse thing um, <laughs> that I mean I think is maybe an attempt to measure. I don't know to what extent. I haven't actually looked at it and I don't intend to actually start answering stuff into it because it seems like another um, another just administrative system, but it's something that the university is rolling out to try and capture um, community engagement. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'll, I'll stop after this. But like the implementation <laughs> science world, I mean, you, know, you have a few folks like Washington University, Proctor. I mean, they kind of put their stamp on this is how you measure IS. Here are the IS measures. I mean, it would seem like there potentially is a similar opportunity in community engagement to say not just doing it, but here's how you measure how well it's being right. done. Yeah. Um, the Carnegie classifications, those would be one um, of how you measure community engagement. That's one way that the universe, colleges and universities are being measured. So that comes out of North Carolina. I think that UNC is probably the closest to putting their stamp on something like that versus anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, so yeah, yes. That, that, so there's some there's some overlap and community engaged work and, and how service learning overplays in that. So there are some uh, really robust centers uh, at other institutions across the country. Michigan State happens to have a really, really good one. Um, and uh, that, that do this type of work. Um, but in terms of measuring that kind of thing, I just don't know how much work's been done. Good, good. Good, something for me to do over the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good. I think you can get done over the summer. For sure. yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right. So now, as we think about uh, from community to community engagement to what is the marriage between community engagement and actually scholarship, and I just had this one slide just to kind of demonstrate. So, to traditional scholarship, what's traditionally done behind the four walls of the institution is what you see on the left. Uh, discovery, teaching, application, and integration. The only thing, but tends to be a pretty hard thing, that community engagement or that engagement adds to that is the sharing of knowledge, the reciprocal sharing of knowledge, and collaborative relationships. And as Dr. Sag mentioned, having, pati uh, having patients, consumers, stakeholders, clients, you name it, uh, in meaningful roles within research um, uh, protocols. So the scholarship of engagement consists of research, teaching, integration, and application types of scholarship that then incorporate reciprocal practices of civic engagement into the production of knowledge. And again, uh, to Muggs's point, I'll, I'll um, reiterate that the scholarship on the left side 
can be from any methodology, quantitative, qualitative. Qualitative folks don't own community engagement yet. Um, so community engaged research. Um, let me uh, um, just mention here. So see, you'll see community engaged research in the literature as C E R or C E N R. So C E R, I, I, I think I, I figured out a couple of years ago was also uh, the abbreviation for some medical. Yeah. So I like, like my, my physician friends might not know what I'm talking about, but I'm clearly talking about C E N R. So that'll be the, the acronym that I use going forward. So what is community engaged research? So I mentioned earlier, it's a framework. It is not a methodology, okay? CBPR, community-based participatory research, is a methodology. And there are lots of community engaged research methodologies. Applied, uh, applied research, needs assessments, those kinds of things can all be community engaged, like CBPR. Community engaged research requires partnership development, cooperation, negotiation, and commitment to addressing local health issues. We mentioned that it exists on a continuum, and it must take into account that every community and what makes up a community is different. So if I'm doing prep work, I'm pointing to, to, to Matt, um, then, and I'm interested in why African American men who have sex with men are not uptaking prep. My strategies in working with that population might be very different from somebody who's doing work with sex workers, okay? That's a pretty stark difference. But understanding the diversity of these, uh, the populations and the individuals and the communities that we work with, and then being open to letting the, 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 the community help define the unique and different ways that uh, academia can work with them. And it involves, community engaged research involves meaningful participation. So some exemplars might include, this does not mean that every community engaged research project has to have these things. It also does not mean that if you have these things that it is community engaged research, right? But some exemplars might include community stakeholders on project steering committees and other deliberative and decision-making bodies, such as community <coughs> advisory boards. Um, it usually will compensate for the community's time and other contributions, which has uh, implications for our, our grant budgets. Think about that early on. Um, and it also generally includes um, meaningful and purposeful dissemination of results of studies back to the community. So that bi-directional, genuine, communi continuous communication is vitally important to co uh, community engaged research as well. Community engaged research is not, maybe this is my favorite slide, <laughs> it is not focus groups or interviews, it is not a bolt-on, and so what I mean by that is it's not, it's not your research on, um, I'm, I just, I'm just picking things out of my head. Uh, it's not your vaccine research and all of a sudden you say, oh, we need to know what the community thinks about this at the last minute. Not a bolt-on. I mentioned it's not a research methodology. It's not a one-size-fits-all fits, one size fit all approach. It is also not appropriate for all research. So there is a place for research that is not community engaged, okay? Um, recruitment of minority research participants does not equate to community engaged research. It's much more than that. And it also is not relinqu relinquishing of all insight or control by researchers. So it's not going into the community and say, here you go, have at it, good luck. So researchers maintain their role with their expertise at research, but understand that and, 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 and articulate what they do not know, relying on the expertise of the lived experiences of the community. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly um, because there's several slides about values inherent to community engaged research and then we'll leave some time at the end for, for some more discussion. I also want to go over an example. Um, but the values of community engaged research are that the investigators and communities understand exactly what community engaged research is. 
so important. Uh, the relationship or the partnership between the community and the investigator is strong. There's shared power and responsibility equitably. Diverse perspectives and populations are, are valued. Research goals are clear and relevant. And you can see as I'm going through these values, it, I, I, what I hope you see is that you, it, it would be difficult to be in, an engaged researcher just and fly by the seat of your pants. This is purposeful, this takes time, it takes patience, right? Research project results and mutual benefit for all partners. Communities and investigators have the opportunity to build capacity, so the idea is not parachuting in to a community and saying, answer all these questions for me because I'm, it's very important for me because this is my research agenda, and then leave it. That's like the worst thing that can happen. Um, all partners receive equal respect. Communications are continuous. The monitoring and evaluation process is transparent. So along with this is, is not making assumptions of what the community does or does not know. And if you know it as a researcher, then through community engaged research, your obligation is to share it and to assess the knowledge of the community and then to build capacity and be open to them doing the same for you, for things that you don't understand. Um, Early on, establish appropriate policies regarding ownership and dissemination and include community members in manuscripts, in grant proposals, as principal investigators, on posters. Don't be afraid and don't think that they don't care. Um, so I suspect that someone in this room really, and okay, it's me, likes to <laughs> add things to their, their curriculum vita. It really doesn't matter if it's my abstract or if it's one that Michael wrote or if it's one that Katie wrote and they just asked me for my uh, opinion or quick review or just put me on it because they're my friends. I like to add it to my resume and I promise you that my community outside of these four walls likes to see their name on things too. It's not just us. Partners translate research findings into policies, interventions, and programs, and this leads into the sustainability of the relationship. So the relationship is not defined by a research project. The relationship exists before, and ideally, it exists before the, the, the conceptualization of the research project and extends beyond the end of the funding. Talked about this. I think I have the same slide in twice, my shock face. Um, so let me talk a little bit about an example. And the example that I'm going to share is actually from funding that I received from the Center for the Study of Community Health, which I think is the center that you might have been referring to um, that um, has been doing uh, community engaged work for some time. So consider this research question. How are community level influences present in one's lived environment, associated with known predictors of adherence to medical care. So I altered this a little bit to be a little bit more general, but it had HIV all in there originally. So think about this. How are community level influences present in one's lived environment, associated with known predictors of adherence to care? How might a researcher design a study to answer this question? So the easy answer is, survey, we could do various uh, uh, um, empirically validated instruments um, about um, life in the community. There's, there's many ways to do it, all that. When I look at this though, as a social worker, I think first, as a social work researcher second, and as someone who tries to be community engaged, I think, well, I'm not gonna know the answer to this. I can design the study. I've got that expertise. But in order to get the information that I want, who's gonna know best about community level influences present in one's lived environment than asking the people who live it every single day? It just seems so simple to me. Probably is. So with this funding from the Center for the Study of Community Health, it was a, a community health um, pilot, community health scholars pilot award. 
Um, I'm not really going to talk about the, the ins and outs of the study that much. I want you to hear more about the process of community engagement for the purposes of this talk. So the process around that was um, I began to build relationships with a community partner and stakeholders before I put in the application. So I've been interested for a long time, long before there was a PhD after my name, in what are the community level influences on health outcomes in general. So I knew ahead of time, I'm gonna want to ask questions about this. So I worked much time outside of these four walls, at, down the road, in the communities, building relationships that would help me answer these questions. We had initial discussions, both formal and informal. So I convened stakeholders around the table, but I also talked to people in waiting rooms at aid service organizations. Um, assess stakeholder buy-in for a proposal. So as um, the information that I began to gain about how to answer that question, a proposal starts to form in my head. And then ask people, well, what do you think about this idea? How do you think this would play out? Um, how, would it be, how would it be received by the community? So not just how would it answer my question, but how would it be perceived? And then there is the letter, so the all important letter of support. So there's nothing wrong with asking for a letter of support, but doing so in the spirit of community engagement is something a little bit different than some people might do. Um, I engage these stakeholders in brainstorming around specific aims. You think stakeholders know something about specific aims? Maybe not, they might not call it, call it specific aims, but they knew what, we together had discussed being the outcome of the research. And so they provided meaningful input into the specific games. And I made sure that from that point on, I incorporated community voices. So I'm not gonna go over these, but these are the specific games that um, the community helped me come up with that apparently reviewers at some level thought were valid. Um, and the idea of this study was really to understand um, what neighborhood or community level influences um, meant to people and, had, and, and what their perceptions were of how those influences um, interacted or were associated with their HIV health. So this was a community-based participatory research project, specifically um, using that methodology. And I convened, uh, so those, those informal and formal discussions of stakeholders kind of evolved organically into a community advisory board that began to meet monthly. This is before, the, actually before the, the, the study was even funded. Okay, so I had submitted the proposal, but before it was even funded, this advisory board was meeting. Um, it informed key aspects of the study, including in -depth inter developing the in-depth interview guide. So, I know how to develop, as a mixed methodologist, I know how to develop an interview guide, but I don't always know the best wording to ask the particular target population. And so there was feedback in terms of the interview guide, the informed consent document. Is this understandable? Will people be turned off? Will people be afraid to participate in this study um, using certain terminology? And participant incentives. I completely changed the incentive structure because I clearly was not paying what the community thought I should be paying for what I was asking of them. So I had to go to my chair and beg for additional money. Like I didn't have enough money in the project to go to my chair and say, can you, can you get, find some more money for me to pay the community what they believe that this amount of their time is worth? And we did it. Um, they provided strategies for recruitment, ongoing and continued ongoing input through implementation. Remember that this advisory board met monthly and continues to this day to meet monthly. We trained community members and to conduct grounded theoretical approach coding and analysis. So we trained community members how to do qualitative coding and they did a remarkable job. We provided explanation of findings to the board we collaborated on the dissemination efforts, discussed the application to real world settings. So now that we've done this study and we've collected this data, data, what now? What does this mean for me as a community member? And I mentioned that the, that the board continues to be monthly to contribute to new ideas and new proposals. Now, when you think about what, what good is this? And, and as, a, as a young, as a junior investigator, as a young academician, 
Um, you've got all of these pressures. I've got to publish. I've got to be productive. And there's no way to do this. Um, and I would argue that you're wrong. Um, so these are six um, presentations on this study. And you'll see the author line for each of them. I am not the first author. I'm the first author on one of them. Um, the first authors are either graduate students or community members, and then the other authors are all community members with some uh, academic collaborators um, in there from time to time. Um, these are presentations at well-respected national and international conferences. Um, there are two additional abstracts currently under review and two manuscripts that we're very near completion. Um, so. There is a way to be productive doing community engaged research. It takes time, it takes deliberation, but it can be done. Barriers. Um, there are lots of ideas and preconceptions that the community has about research and academia. And I think that that's particularly true in Birmingham, Alabama. I'll leave it there. Um, so overcoming that is difficult. And assuming that it's not there or not important is naive. Um, so particularly in working with African American communities, um, uh, thinking that the Tuskegee experiments um, don't mean anything is just wrong. And so you have to think about how do you gain the trust of the community and maintain it. So, History of leaving community concerns and interest out of the research agenda leading leads to caution on part of the communities. Um, uh, selecting topics without determining if they, if they address perceived needs. So if I go in and I want to do prep work and the community doesn't care about prep, I'm probably not going to be very successful in my work. Sorry to pick on you, Matt. I do, I do some prep work too. <laughs> uh, but it's difficult, right? We were talking about that right before the, the, the this, the talk. Studies conducted on communities, this is a history that we have, conducted on communities where the only involvement was community members as research subjects leads to significant barriers to overcome. If there's no mechanism for sharing the research findings, um, communities have felt um, that they seldom receive the benefits of the research. So how does this apply to me? Does it save my brother? Does it save my church member? Those are the things that can ring, ring true. And then, of course, a barrier is time, as we mentioned, that research often um, an additional responsibility for already overworked individuals and organizations with their own mission and mandates to fulfill. Um, Dr. Crockett and I worked on a project that that was just, uh, very, it was just in our face about how much we assumed that an organization just wanted to be part of what we were doing and it would be so easy. And it was really a tremendous burden for that organization to take it on. They did it, they were troopers, we worked with them, but we really had to, I think it's fair to say we had to pull back and rethink um, our strategy. And actually what it took was for Kaylee to go in herself and to be present and to help facilitate that research probably more than we would have liked to um, initially. Fair to say. Um, and unclear distinctions between re research, advocacy, and administrative change can lead to unrealistic expectations. Um, there are also academic barriers, which I won't spend a lot of time going through because I think they are apparent. Time, of course, is one that we've talked about. Um, Community-engaged research may not fit, fit neatly within the academic status quo. I don't think it does. I continually feel like an outsider in this institution. I kind of like it, though, by the way. I, I kind of thrive on that. Um, but it is something that I consist. I have to talk about community engagement all the time because there's this continuum and some people are not on the continuum and some people are here on the continuum or here on the continuum and think that they're here. And so Edward Jackson works with me with the Center for AIDS Research and um, we spend, he spends 100% of his time working uh, and, and trying to promote community engagement efforts um, for the center. <clears throat> Community members are impatient. They don't understand the amount of time it takes from the time that, think about the time that you talked, that I talked about this proposal as the example, to the time that we collected data, to the time that we actually analyzed the data and had the results. It, it, the funding may have only been for a year. I can't really remember, maybe it was two. Um, but we're still, 
working on disseminating and analyzing results um, three years post that. And so have it, ha helping the, the uh, community to understand those, uh, those types of barriers is, is uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, and have an academic journals, some academic journals will not publish articles whose findings have been previously disseminated via newspaper and television. And this is sometimes important to the community. So if it's relevant, if you're doing something that's relevant to my community, we want my neighbors, I want my neighbors to know about it. I want the neighbors in the, in the community down the street to know about it. And sometimes when that's done, uh, journals will not accept an article. And then how to give results uh, to a community in a timely manner without compromising the researcher's ability to present findings in, in academic venues is another barrier. And then the benefits, I think, far outweigh the barriers. For me, um, develop research questions about health uh, issues of concerns to the community that the community helps you define. Um, the community is key in helping to recruit participants. And in HIV work, we frequently are trying to reach and enroll participants from hard to reach populations, um, ostracized groups um, living on the fringe um, that are at the highest risk of, of, of contracting or transmitting HIV. And so in order to get into those networks, um, we need the community to tell us how to, how to do that. Uh, Community-engaged research can help us identify risk associated with participation and help develop appropriate ways to protect participants. Think about the input that I had from my board on the informed consent document is an example of that. Um, it improves study and instrument design through community input. Communities involvement and analysis and interpretation can provide important explanations of results, some things that you might overlook. Um, also an opportunity to build greater trust and respect between academic researchers and the communities. If you don't get outside of these four walls very often talking about your research, I encourage you to do it and be open to what the community thinks about this institution. So I come to work every day thinking about how lucky I am to be an employee and a faculty member at UAB and I know the great work that my colleagues in many different departments and, and schools across campus do. The community does not always think that UAB is so great. And so you must, oftentimes you must overcome this before anything else happens. Community-engaged research, I believe, can be more likely to, to lead to improvements in community health if the community voices are involved. And that, to me, is the heart of the matter. Um, just as a quick recap, why do we conduct research? We, we conduct research to explore, to describe, to explain. Why do we conduct community-engaged research? Because health problems exist within the context of people's lives and the explanations for those problems will likely be found in the messy complexity in real life. And then we'll open it up for questions. You're talking about increasing the amount of um, money that's given to participants because your community members said this is a, a fair um, exchange for their time. I think we run up against um, worries about coercion often. And I'm wondering whether you've had community boards or involved community members who've been able to weigh in and push back against that. And if you have good advice for um, dealing with IRBs and other things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, I think so. There are a few questions in there, so let me unpack it. Um, I, I absolutely have had uh, community members be able to weigh in on coercion and putting uh, potential human subjects at risk. Um, I'm not so I don't did not go into this community group that that I gave an example um, with them knowing all of this. Some of this was learned over time, um, but. Being patient, the community did understand the importance of not coercing people into, into research. And inherently, they knew it all along. And so now, I get much more meaningful feedback, whether it be about coercion or incentives or IRB than I did early on. 
but I think that's a really interesting question, and it kind of speaks to the distinction you made between being a participant and being a subject in the study. And so I think we're, again, I'm using PCORI just as the engine that's sort of galvanized some of my thinking on this in a very uh, direct way because it's a requirement for the grants. But there, you know, you've got to pay people, that you've got to pay community members to be part of your study. And you got to pay them at the rate that you're paying other investigators. So they're not subjects in the study, but they're actually investigators. They're part of the research team. And that's a very different role than being a member of a focus group or being a participant, signing a consent form and undergoing the study. So I think that's one of the, the key distinctions that's, for me, changed dramatically with the advent of, of this um, activity in the US. And it's really now permeated NIH as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that the other thing that I would mention, I don't think I've said this word in this talk and that's unusual for me, but transparency. So if I had, so it was very real possibility that after I received feedback from the community about the incentives that I would have had to come back and tell them, I don't have an option. The budget's been written. I can't find any additional money. I, I don't have an option. So I can't be afraid of that. I have to be transparent in, in, in the communication with the community to say why. And sometimes just being able to say, I'm sorry, I screwed up this time. Um, we'll do it better the next time. And that really goes a long way. Really, just honesty and transparency. Was there other questions impacted in that that I may have missed? They get it? OK, all right, great. Yes, um, how do you navigate fatigue on the part of marginalized populations? For these requests for research, because I mean, they're like especially local organizations like Magic City Acceptance Center and BAO. I mean, they're like there have to be people asking all the time if they want to do research, and that just seems kind of like you're just trying to like you know take information out of people, yeah. like they're just a ready group. There's not an easy answer to, to that question, I don't think. Um, there, there is definitely lots of research fatigue um, in the in the community um, around lots of different topics. Um, we're not going to stop doing research. Right? We have we, we kind of have to do it. That's what we're here for. We want to do it. So um, I, again, I think that um, anytime I can re re uh, recruit someone in academia to be an ambassador to talk about, yeah, we got all of these options, all of these things going on, but here, here, here's why, and the end result is broad public health that applies to you directly. I know that that doesn't sound very scientific, but I mean, it's just, it's just really about forming, um, honest, genuine relationships and being, and being, again, being transparent with people. Um, my partners, um, at, um, so I do uh, most of my work at Birmingham AIDS Outreach. And um, part of them helping me become a better community engaged researcher, I think that I've been able to help them become better stewards of staff and client resources. And um, I, I've really helped to empower their executive director, who doesn't need a lot of help being empowered, um, to, to say no. And not to say no to be mean, but to say no because I don't have room, I don't have an interview room, I don't have a place to put my staff, I don't have enough staff to do this. I, my clients are complaining because they don't know um, which, um, which vaccine study they're being asked to be in. And so all of that, all of that happens. And I think part of it is education. Part of it is being present and talking a lot about kind of the 30,000 foot view of what we do. Um, <coughs> not a great answer. Scott, I recognize that. Yeah. To follow up on Sarah's question, I think maybe you could speak to, independent of your research, your role with Eddie within the CFAR around community engagement. So I think, as I heard Sarah's question, I was thinking about four different investigators pop into the same office and then the person goes, but UAB was just here, not realizing these are four different UAB people. And it's like this idea that there is just this giant UAB so that when faced with four different investigators coming in and that that's their big project, maybe you could reflect a little bit in terms of the new role within the CFAR Payable Community Sciences Corps around community engagement, separate from your independent 
research and, and how to kind of to navigate some of the finders, you know, those challenges? So, yeah, so the vision for mine and Eddie's role is to kind of coordinate that. Um, I, I think, so that, that's kind of what we want it to be, is, is, to, is, is to kind of help people link to the right um, partners and at the right times and to, and to provide entree to people so um, somebody in the community knows that four investigators are coming to talk to about this before four investigators just show up. Um, and we've been successful in doing that to some degree, and Eddie, I would welcome you to chime in if you would like. Um, we've been successful to some degree, but what Mug said, if you heard, is that UAB is huge, and so two people are not going to be able to do that. So I believe um, that we that that we all have to consider our set. I mean, each of you are part of a community outside of this university, and I think that we have to be stewards of our own community as well. I don't know if that really gets to what you're talking about. Um, we we also uh, do have been planning and do a lot of capacity building. Um, uh, that that's just kind of a a, a very foundational um, service that our core behavioral and community sciences core provides to both the academic community and the broader community at large. And in fact, um, next month, uh, we're going to have a workshop um, around research in, the, in, in community organizations, research as a resource for the community organization. What we're going to talk about things there is what there's going to be a panel to talk about what the challenges are from the perspective of the community-based organization, the, uh, the perspective of the faith-based community, um, and the perspective of an academic ac academician. Um, we're also going to include um, uh, Carrie Oliver from the from from UAB IRB is going to come out into the community and talk to us about um, kind of research IRB regulatory 101. Um, because if you're going to include community members as PIs and members of your investigative team, they have to go through the same protection of human subjects that we have to go through. It's interesting as you're talking, Scott. You know. I'm reflecting on some of the other UWorks, and I don't, I'm not as familiar with other UWorks, but I'm more familiar with the methods course. So we can help you do CBPR, but as you're talking about this larger community engagement, I don't know how many other, you know, because a lot of it does come disease specific, because it is, like, you know, it, it, within a community, there are a certain number of agencies focusing on these same communities. So it does a lot of times revolve around either diseases or conditions, prevention, treatment. Um, and again, just thinking about opportunities to engage council, senator, others, just to kind of talk about and get a sense for what it is. Maybe Blaze the poll. I don't know if Blaze is doing this, but you know, what is the what is the landscape? Because like, I've learned so much from you over the years, and one of the things I hear repeatedly is, "I'm doing community engagement research. I do CDPR. and it's almost like these things are synonymous. Not that this is a method for a broader. And I, again, I'm more familiar with centers offering services for the methods but not the framework as you define it so nicely. Well, so I think that our core believes that we provide um, service in, 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 in helping researchers become familiar with this framework. Um, but I don't know that we do a very good job of, of um, marketing it, number one. And then secondly, um, you know, it's, it's supply and demand. People won't want uh, uh, information on CBPR. They don't, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a catch-22. And I'll add to that, CCPS, we have our One Great Community, which is our community engagement core. And Max Michael has put together collaboratory, or he, he's not put it together, but anyway, he's adopted collaboratory for us. And that is together the community engagement scholarship that's happening around campus. Mm -hmm. So it is supposed to be a landing spot eventually. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about engaging in a discussion with other center directors where, you know, similar to what you're you're doing in the HIV space, it'd be really interesting to know. What is the, the DRC and doing in diabetes? You know, what, what are different? This, I think Max's work is amazing, but because CCTS is so broad, a lot of this comes down to if you want to do diabetes research in the black belt, here are the clinics or the agency. You know what I mean? So it becomes very much more around disease. I mean, the broad stuff is really important, but just I think yeah. both of them exploring them could be really interesting. I'm still thinking about your question about the research fatigue. I think that's a really, really interesting question. And it really speaks to sort of a broader policy and public health issue, and that is how do we collectively, UAB, academic institutions, people interested in research, how do we make a better argument to the public in general that this is important? And there's actually an ethical framework for it. It's a principle of common good. There's a, something 
called the Hastings Report, written by two bioethicists at Hopkins, Gass, and Faden, that really spoke to the importance of patients recognizing that there's a moral imperative to be part of research in order to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare delivery. And so we, we got to somehow get the word out. I mean, it, it's, it's a PR problem. It's really what the, the challenge is. And it becomes more challenging in disenfranchised communities for all the reasons that have been described and discussed today. But uh, I think this is, to me, a fascinating policy issue. And really uh, it is a challenge. And you know, we have a study now funded by NCATS trying to improve minority recruitment in clinical trials and trying to overcome some of the barriers of getting participation in a generalizable way so that studies really reflect the community at large. that have come down federally for a focus on the Deep South. Uh, what we have seen, um, I, so I, my mentors have kind of opened my eyes to this, but we have these people who are not from here, all wanting to come down here and do research. And I think that's a lot of what the Mississippi folks were, were saying, that you know they, they pick up the phone and, and it's somebody from the University of Chicago saying, I want to do research with rural people in Mississippi. And they're like, what? What do you know about rural Mississippi? And so part of that, we're well positioned for that kind of work anyway. So. I, I hope some of it is the approach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for people where it brings me to fatigue is when they see researchers come in with their helicopters, drop in their surveys, pull out their information, and just leave never to be seen again. And I think as researchers, what we've learned through our work with them is we have to be really thoughtful about how we communicate our results back and what that means on balancing the fact that as researchers, we're on this timeline where we have to get our and at some point, you have to kind of pull back and like who's on our team to do that momentum for Exactly. Yeah, and that is a challenge. Other questions or comments? So I am, um, and you'll have this, but I, I am, oh, thanks everybody. Um, I'm, I'm available. I'm happy to talk with anyone. My colleagues are available uh, as well to talk to anyone. Um, I will make sure that Jeff sends out the announcement for the event uh, that the Behavioral and Community Sciences Corps is doing next month. Um, so if you would uh, be interested in, in kind of seeing the interactions between community and research in that space, you would be welcome to attend. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Any announcements? Any good news? Anything great? Yeah, there is an announcement. There's a really great talk uh, tomorrow. It's today. 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 Tomorrow, Saturday. It's like it's yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's just left away. What time is it? It's at 1 o'clock. It's, it's from the biostatistics department. Right. Um, the title is um, Sacrilege How to Analyze Data from Community Studies That Are Not Experimental. Right, so almost a perfect segue from this discussion, but into sort of the analytic framework. And I think it'll really be interesting, sort of pseudo experimental designs of uh, community study. Yeah. In uh, the School of Public Health this location. Of the room, I think, is on the fifth floor. 507. 507? Thank you. <laughs> also, um, Lisa Jackson's reception yesterday. Yes. So, Quite lovely. Was exciting and got a professorship. So it was a reception here for our very own Dr. Jackson. Yeah, very well deserved. And then Lord out of Friday fellows, we're going to change the name instead of to be or not to be, it's going to be to P value or not to P. Um, but the great P value debate, and I think Sarah, that was your idea, but P 
uh, the board has this group. So here you see there'll be the forum on May 8th, the great P value yes. debate. And then we're going to continue that debate in the Friday Fellows on May 10th. So you can come and get the start. And then I think Dustin and David have this idea about providing the room. 